Hi there, everybody. Welcome to Organisational Behaviour. I'm Dr. Robert Cluley. This is course code Buzzy1029. In this session, we're going to talk about group formation. If you think back to our early definition of organisations, we talked about organisations emerging when groups of people decide that they have some mutual goal or objective that they want to achieve. We've spent a bit of time on the course so far thinking about the nature of those goals and how they might motivate people. In this topic we're going to start thinking about how the interactions between people, the groups that form organisations, explains people's behaviour within organisations. So in this session we're going to focus on the ways that groups form. We're going to start out by describing the benefits of group working. Hopefully you'll be able to distinguish between formal and informal groups. And then we're going to cover some of the main models of group formation. We're going to look at Homan's, Tucker and Bayon models of group formation. The core reading for this session is Kuczynski and Buchanan chapter 9 in the 6th edition, chapter 10 in the 9th edition. However, I would emphasise there is some material in this lecture which is not included in the book. So firstly, what is a group? What are we talking about when we talk about a group? Well, clearly a group is not one person. A group involves two or more people. However, just because you've got two or more people does not necessarily mean that you've got a group. You know, two people standing next to each other in a bus stop is not a group. Two students sitting next to each other in the library are not a group. Groups imply some kind of relationships between the two members. The group should have some kind of a collective identity. And typically, we're going to see, there tends to be some kind of a structure, some kind of roles that develop between the people. And this is what distinguishes groups from what we might call aggregates of people. It also starts to help us distinguish between groups and organisations groups might have an identity, they might have a role structure, they might even have a division of labour, but they don't necessarily have a clear objective. Groups, though, are, to some extent, the building blocks of organisations. In comparison to individuals, groups introduce economies of scale, scope and specialisation. That is to say, when you have a group of people as opposed to an individual, the group typically can do more things, has more specialists, so you can have people in a group with particular skills. However, a further advantage of groups over individuals is that group relations can motivate individuals to achieve higher performance than when they're working alone. When we talked about motivation, we talked about high-performing teams. And here the idea is if a group is well organised, it uses the features of groups, the group's identity, its structure and so on and so forth, what we might call the group relationships, to motivate individuals to a higher level of performance than if they were working alone. But the opposite of that is also true, that group relations can be organised in such a way that they demotivate performance. So let's think about how groups can achieve particular types of tasks. The literature tends to distinguish three types of tasks. We can have additive tasks, which are tasks which depend on the sum effort of all group members. So this might mean each member of the group does the same job or part of a job that is reliant on others. And when this happens, the output is a function of group size, so the more people that you have, the more work that can be done. An example would be um, an organisation operating what's known as a click farm, where you have somebody literally clicking on links on their computer and getting paid for it. The more people you have clicking, the more work that can be done. This is an additive task. Each individual that you add 
improves the amount of output that you can achieve. For additive type tasks, groups almost always outperform individuals. Now there is a diminishing return at a certain point. When you have too many people in a group, they start to become difficult to organize in a way that motivates and maximizes groups. However, generally speaking, in additive tasks, the more people that you have, the more you can produce. So a factory typically can outproduce an individual worker. But not all tasks are additive. We also have conjunctive tasks. In conjunctive tasks, there's a high level of interdependency among the groups, with each member of the group not necessarily doing the same thing. And in a conjunctive task, performance typically depends, the level of performance is typically defined at the weakest link. So an example would be in a relay race, the team that wins may not have the fastest runner, but they will have not have the slowest runner. So the team that wins doesn't need to have the fastest runner, but they just need to include none of the slowest runners. Another good example would be a musical performance where if you have one player in an orchestra who is out of tune, they make everybody out of tune. So this is a conjunctive task. Groups can perform better than individuals, but not necessarily so in conjunctive tasks, tasks that require different people to do different things. There are also what are known as disjunctive tasks. And these are similar in that there's a high level of inter interdependency between the group members and that they're not necessarily doing the same task. But here, performance isn't defined by the weakest member of the group, but rather the strongest member of the group. And again, in these instances, groups might not necessarily perform better than individuals. An example would be a professional sports team or more individual professional sports. So you'll often hear, say, boxers after they've won saying that it was a team effort and that their trainers and their managers and their promoters and their nutritionists and their strength and, nu strength and conditioning people all contributed to their victory. And they did. However, you could have the best trainer with the worst boxer and they'll lose because performance depends on the best member of the team. And in these instances, it's often individuals which can outperform groups. So you can have amazing sportsmen with far inferior teams behind them, but their performance can still be the winning performance because the tasks are disjunctive. What does this mean? Well, it means groups can, can have higher performance than individuals, but not necessarily. It depends on the nature of the group, the way the group's organized, but also the nature of the task. So when we think about some of the benefits of group working, we need to understand that those benefits, those economies of scale and scope, depend on the nature of the task. Is it an additive task, a conjunctive task, a disjunctive task? They also depend on the nature of the group. We're gonna talk a little bit more about how groups work in a later video. For the time being, we want to think more about how groups form. Firstly, let's think about some of the different types of groups and how we can explain group effects. Hopefully across your studies, you've also already come across the Hawthorne studies. The Hawthorne studies explain group effects by showing how groups develop norms, and police behaviours of its members. They get individuals to invest in the group and this encourages higher performance. One of the other findings of the Hawthorne studies was that irrelevant of how a group might be organised, say, by managers, when you put people together, they often will move from aggregates, just collections of people, to what the Hawthorne researchers, Elton Mayo in particular, called natural groups. And these are groups of typically three to six people. And they start to develop organic structures and relationships. 
Mayo observed, once you've got a natural group that emerges of three to six people, they'll often attract more members. And he called the next size of group family groups. He said this would be groups with eight to 30 people typically. And whereas natural groups might have sort of rotating relationships, rotating roles, families will start to have more formal structure. Then he said strong uh, organizations will understand the family groups and they will organize around the family groups. So you can think of natural groups as being the building blocks of organizations. And this is a point that was emphasized across the 1980s and 1990s by a number of management gurus who argued that rather than enforcing particular divisions and working structures through bureaucracy, high performance teams grant a great deal of autonomy to groups and allow them to self-organize. So you could say that natural groups have been recognized as being the sort of building blocks of organizations and that recognizing those natural groups is a really effective way to organize. It's also been recognized when we think about different types of groups that groups relate to each other and this is how you start to get organizations. Um, Reynes Likert, a very famous psychologist, noticed that groups in many organizations tend to be linked together by particular members which he called linking pins. If you think back to our work on the American Mafia we talked about how they would have captains who operate to join together different groups in a family. This is what Levitt is talking about. So early on in the study of groups, it was recognized that there's different types of groups that relate to each other in different ways. And over time, this has been built up into a more formal typology of groups. It's common here to distinguish between what are known as formal groups, which like formal organizations tend to be more explicit. They tend to be organized around a particular task, they tend to be permanent, they tend to have a formal structure that all of their members recognize, they tend to be coordinated and exist in coordination with other groups. So this we might call formal groups, so an example would be a department in an organization, a formal department in an organization. There are also informal groups which relate quite neatly onto our definition of informal organizations. These tend to be spontaneous or unplanned groups that can form within a formal group. So if we think of formal groups as what Mayo calls organized groups, informal groups relate quite strongly to the natural grouping that we talked about earlier on. Sometimes these are called work groups in the human relations literature. The argument is it's easy for managers and designers of organizations to specify the formal groups that they want, but it's a lot harder to control how informal groups form. However, as we've seen in um, the work of Emery, Trist and others in the human relations school, recognizing the work groups or the informal groups, organizing around them is often a much more effective way to operate. It's noted then that a lot of groups self-organize, are relevant of the ways that organizations design formal groupings. Even within formal groupings, we tend to have informal groupings emerge. So you might have somebody that's given a leadership role formally, but informally they might be a follower, they might rely on somebody else. You might have a member of a group that is just a member of a group but actually they have a great deal of influence and power. And no matter whether it's a formal or an informal group, there's a range of, um, and I'm sorry this slide's not easy to read, there's a range of issues that all groups face. They have to think about their atmosphere and relationships. What kinds of participation levels do they expect? Are they going to sh share information throughout the group? How are they going to handle disagreements and conflicts? How will they reach decisions? How are they going to evaluate performance? How are they going to divide labor? What kind of leadership will they have? How much should they rely on processes and administration? These are common issues facing all groups, formal and informal. So just as 
poor organisational practices ignore informal work groups. Poor organisations typically don't address these kinds of issues. As you start doing group work over your university degree, many of you will find that it's precisely the failure to address these issues in advance which explains why some of your groups don't work effectively. It's precisely because you haven't divided labour. You haven't thought about how you can evaluate performance or deal with disagreements and conflicts that some members of your groups might free, free ride or free load. Free ride, free loading, something different. <laughs> free ride. That they, you might suffer the tragedy of the commons, as we've talked about in a previous class. So the key point is good organisations recognise the power of formal groups of deciding on the key issues facing groups, but they also appreciate that there will be informal groups that self-organise and they work with them. Over the last couple of decades, it's been argued that there are another type of groups, uh, virtual groupings of people. Um, early work on this described them in terms of virtual teams. Personally, I'm not so convinced by this. I think many of us are now so used to working virtually and integrating digital communications that actually separating this out as a separate type of grouping to me seems somewhat um, inappropriate. So let's think about where we are. Well, we've described the benefits of group working. We've thought about some of the different types of groups, specifically the, the distinction between formal and informal groupings. Let's think about how we can explain group formation. How do groups form? Homans, 1951, argues that there are a number of elements that we need to take account of when we want to think about the ways that groups form. He says there's a range of background factors, you know, this might be the physical environment, the cultural factors about individuals in the teams, the technologies that they have to use, the organisational contexts, so on and so forth. And those background factors feed into what's asked of people working in organisations. What kind of activities are they asked to do? How are they going to interact? What kinds of norms? Both of them then interact with what Homans calls emergent or actual behaviours that take place in groups. And these emergent or actual behaviours we can track onto what we've previously called informal groupings. Now, formally, an organisation might tell a group to work in a certain way, but then when they're left to it, they're going to develop their own actual or emergent behaviours or informal grouping. And this then leads to a variety of different outcomes. Homan's key argument then is that we have to appreciate that groups typically form out of formal groupings. You have informal factors, formal or required given behaviours and then emergent or informal behaviours. Tucker takes a different approach and tries to think about group formation as a temporal process. That is a process that takes place over time. And Tucker argues that gro all groups go through five stages. First, they form. They then begin to orientate to their task and they storm. Then they start to organise themselves around their task. Then they norm. Then they actually achieve the task, which is performing. And then they start to solve problems and look for new tasks. And eventually they will adjourn or close. Let's unpick each of those somewhat. Forming occurs with an immature or informal group. Tucker says at this stage there tends to be a lot of confusion and uncertainty. People tend to assess the situation and try to figure out what's going on. There's a lot of feeling out. And you can just imagine if you got put into you know, a group with other students that you hadn't met before, the first thing you'd start to do is to sort of establish who is who, get acquainted with each other, try to define what you're trying to do. You would start, in other words, to answer some of the questions that we covered earlier on. Tucker describes this as forming. And Tucker says, after the group has formed, they'll start to storm. Different people will start to struggle for leadership. There might be different tensions. There might be disagreements over priorities for the group. There might be different groupings or informal groups developing within the group. 
this is storming. But out of this process, Tucker says you'll start to get norms developed. There'll start to be some kind of sharing in the group. There'll be a consensus. Leadership will be accepted. Trust will start to be established. Norms and roles, cooperation will start to take place. After this, a group can start to perform. They start to work effectively. They start to specialise, divide roles, and work delusion as a group. And then after they've achieved the task, they have to find some way to break up. And this can, in some cases, be quite a happy experience. You know, when something's been done well, people can leave and feel very um, proud of themselves. However, it can also be quite a tense, um, emotional and painful experience for people that are really invested in a group. And you can see in many instances, individuals might have left the group physically or organisationally, but psychologically they have struggled to. A successful group tends to colour and shape how they frame future problems. So the process of adjourning is not simply a case of, you know, right, we're finished. It's actually thinking, how can you deal with this? In some studies, they found that people have actually gone through, you know, actual grieving processes. So whereas the Homans framework looks at different interrelationships between formal and informal groups, Tucker's framework thinks about group formation as a temporal process. The final model we want to look at is Bayern, Wilfred Bayern. Bayern is a very influential theorist of groups. Bayern argued whenever you put people together, aggregate them and give them a task, a number of different styles of groups can emerge. The first, he argued, is what's called a basic assumption group. And in a basic assumption group, a group very quickly rushes to the norms that it develops. Often, in these basic assumption groups, the individuals expose some of their neuroses, some of their you know, existential problems, and their unconscious drives and desires. So you'll find in basic assumption groups, people might become very strongly reliant on a leader. Bayern calls this a dependency group, where irrelevant of if the leader's good or bad or effective or ineffective, people will just refer to the leader and rely on the leader. Basic assumption groups often end up engaged in what's called fight or flight, where they quickly run to a particular solution and reject everything else. They become very blind. And Bayern says this early formation of groups is quite painful to overcome for individuals. But it's only when a group can overcome these basic assumptions, such as dependency, that they can become a work group. And work groups are defined not by an unhealthy reliance, say, on leadership in the dependency group, but on a much more positive ability to interact and to talk with each other. So... We've briefly described the benefits of group working. We thought about some different typologies of groups and we've briefly been over the different ways that groups can form according to Homans, Tucker and Bayon. If you're interested in reading further, Katzenbach and Santa Maria offer a really neat analysis of teams versus work groups where they really, uh, based on an analysis of the US military, really usefully analyse how groups differ from teams and just aggregates of people, how particular ways of working develop among members of groups that make, make them distinguished as groups and teams. If you've got any questions, please post them to the discussion forum or come to the Ask Me Anything drop-in sessions.